So you might have heard VBS is coming up. Um, strongly recommend signing up, or we will send our Amp Ninja to your house um, to encourage you to sign up. All right, if we have not had a chance to meet, my name is Keith. I'm the lead pastor here. So glad you're with us today. Uh, I am really excited. We are in the third week of a series we're calling It's Not Rocket Science. And it's very rare for me to be stepping into the third week of a series and having not spoken any of the messages in the series uh, so far. So it's kind of new territory for me. But let me just say thank you very much um, for being an amazing church that exports what God is doing here all over the place. Uh, we go and do a lot. We've got a very, very healthy church, and because of that, a lot of times our leaders get requested to go work with other churches. This past week, uh, Jennifer and Nika were working with a church in Louisiana. Last weekend, I was working with one of our churches in Washington, D.C. A lot of our team spent the week prior to that working on a new church that's coming to St. Thomas. Uh, there's a gathering of people waiting there for us to come and plant. So thank you uh, for understanding that God is doing amazing things here, and by virtue of that, we are a church that also sends and releases. So, But it is good to be back. I'm super excited about this series. It's not rocket science, because it kind of combines the strengths of who we are as a preaching team. It's a lot of Bible, straight Bible, straight truth, and healthy doses of that sweet spiritual gift of sarcasm, which we love to have and infuse in our messages. Um, we're taking a look at the life of Daniel, one of the Old Testament heroes, and it's, it's coming through a little bit of a different lens. Sometimes when we look at the, the heroes of the Old Testament, we can magnify them into such giants of the faith that at best we can learn some principles from their life. Maybe we can see something about how God moves so miraculously in their life, but they, they, the, the faith that they had, the courage that they had, the boldness that they have, the, way, the intimacy they had with God, we can almost kind of immortalize them, and they sort of sit on this Mount Olympus of faith, these giants, and there's really no possible way we could attain to their level of greatness. But the reality is why the giants of the Old Testament or the New Testament became giants of the Old Testament and New Testament is because they just walked with God. Like, normally, they are flesh and blood people who walked with an incredible God in many times a very simple, straightforward way. Guys, it's not rocket science. To see God do incredible things in your life, just walk with him. We've been working through this series with Daniel and kind of demystifying this notion of just a great hero and really reducing it to just a good, solid man of God. In week one, in Daniel chapter one, Pastor Heather took some time and worked through this idea of Daniel. It says he purposed in his heart not to defile himself. He was living in this culture of Babylon, which was not terribly unlike America today. Truth was up for grabs. What was right and what was wrong was up for grabs. All kinds of weird viewpoints. It wasn't the, the, the land because he was in exile. It wasn't the land he grew up in. There weren't a whole lot of other followers. He felt isolated in many ways. But he made a simple decision. He purposed in his heart not to defile himself. And defile, as Pastor Heather explained, it means to pollute. And we can look and go, wow, what a great man of God. But when you understand what he did, he just decided not to pollute himself. Like, it's not rocket science. Sometimes we can think, well, the culture was against him and the peer pressure he must have faced. But there's just not much peer pressure to polluting. I loved her illustration of like, really what he decided not to do was to climb down in the tank of like a porta potty. How much peer pressure would it take for you to go in there swimming? None. Yet we interact with the world in such a way that we pollute ourselves all the time. We would never jump into a porty potty, but we invite it into our soul and our thought life and our emotions an awful lot. And we simply need to purpose not to be some incredible man or woman of faith. Just don't pollute yourself. It's pretty straightforward. It's not rocket science. Last week, Pastor Barry talked about one of these incredible power encounters that happen. And there were sorcerers and witch doctors and all kinds of, you know, idol worshipers. And the king had a dream and he turned to some of them and said, help me interpret this dream. And they were trying to access power outside of the power of God. And it turns out that the only one who was actually talking to God about the king's situation was Daniel and his friends. 
And by virtue of talking to God, God speaks back. And all of a sudden, they came with wisdom and insight and power that only comes from God. And guys, it's not rocket science. If you and I, as followers of Christ, walk in the power of God, there is no other power that's comparable. In fact, to pursue power other than the power of God is to pursue less power. So why would you and I find ourselves trying to promote ourselves or chase power and affirmation in a different way? Just, just find it in God. It's not rocket science. Anything less than him is less than what you and I have access to. We're going to take a look at chapter 3 of Daniel today. And what we're going to see is amazing moral clarity. Daniel, yes, he had faith. Yes, he was a great man of God. But he really was just crystal clear on who God is. And we can learn a lot from his moral clarity. See, the, the, the darker our culture gets, sometimes we go, oh no, it's dark. Oh no, my school doesn't believe what I believe. Oh no, in my workplace, they're trying to silence me talking ab about God. And this darkness makes us go, oh no, how will I ever shine my light? Yet the, the, the contrast between light in a dark place is obvious. As muddy as the waters are in our culture today, I would say moral clarity is, is more obvious than ever. When the lights are always on, I can flick on a flashlight, and you may not notice it as much. But when it's dark and something now in darkness comes out bright, it's obvious. And the truth of God and moral clarity is super obvious today. Just because culture is muddy doesn't make truth any muddier. And while we can look at Daniel as this giant... He, He's just a guy that knew God. It's not rocket science. We're going to take a look at Daniel chapter 3. We'll start in verse 12, read through verse 19, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 12. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. I'll bet it did. This is about 19 years after the events of Daniel chapter 2 that we learned about last week. Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had a lot of favor in the kingdom. They had been put in positions of influence. They were leading. These were sharp guys. Even though it wasn't their homeland, because the empire at that time of Babylon was vast, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, knew that he needed a lot of different uh, people to help him lead. So even though they were brought into captivity as exiles, if they had some skill and some talent and some things, he, he mobilized them and got them deployed to help him lead. So in this process of this vast empire and these guys moving sort of up the, the, the food chain in high society, something happens where Nebuchadnezzar decides he's going to build a 90-foot high statue of gold. Now, we don't know what it was a statue of. We don't know if it was Nebuchadnezzar, if he just, hey, here's a big giant me out there, if it was one of the various kind of demon gods, idols that, that they worshiped. But out in a flat plain, it's in a flat area where anybody can look from a long, long distance and go, there's that giant gold thing. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a prolific builder. Historians tell us that across the entirety of the Middle East, 
When they go through ancient ruins, right now they say 19 out of every 20 bricks that's unearthed in ancient ruins is stamped, basically, property of Nebuchadnezzar. He laid those bricks. In Baghdad alone, nine out of every 10 bricks that they unearthed from ancient ruins were stamped with Nebuchadnezzar's mark. Prolific builder. But his prime thing that he built, he built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, an ancient wonder of the, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. But the primo thing that he was most excited about now is this 90-foot tall gold statue. And he called all of his governors, and he called all his lieutenants, called all of his administrators, called the people and said, all come out and look at this great gold statue, and here's what's going to happen. When the band strikes up, everybody's going to fall on their face, worship that, and at the same time, you know, worship me. So they go, okay, we'll do that. And he goes, but just, just to make sure that everybody, in fact, worships that thing, if you don't, what we're going to do is we are going to burn you alive. Little bit of incentive to kind of fall down before this statue. And it wasn't just like, hey, we're going to light you on fire. What they would do with making of all these bricks with which he pretty much built the entire Middle East, they had these giant furnaces where they would kind of cook the clay and they would smelt metal and all kinds of cool stuff. It was kind of like a walk-in freezer, only a lot hotter. And he basically said, if you don't bow down to this, you're going into the heater, freezer, heater box. So one of his little kind of brown nosery guys says, hey, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, and he comes up and says this in verse 12, hey, there are some Jews whom you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you've set up. The two most impactful words in that whole sentence to me are some Jews. There are some Jews who are not bowing down to that. Which means there are plenty that are. Now, by definition of being a Jew, you, in that era, you worshipped the God of the Bible, whose first commandment says, you will have no other gods before me. Yet, some Jews honor the first commandment and have no other gods before me. Yet, by definition, some don't. Now, let me help you out. If you are a Jew who does not worship the God of the Jews that by definition makes you a Jew, you're not a Jew. You can say and self-identify as the people of God, but if your God is not God, you're not of the people of God. I kind of wonder sometimes how many Christians don't really worship Christ. I wonder how many Christians today in a modern-day Babylon, when it's all said and done, actually bow their knee to other things. And can I tell you, you can have the name Christian culturally, and you can call yourself one. But if you bow to gods other than Christ, kind of by definition, you're not a Christian. He said in great love for his friends, how many Christians worship things other than Christ? For us to worship Christ, it can't be a moment-by-moment moment decision. It can't be like, oh, it's Sunday morning, hustle off to church, we will worship God in this moment. Oh, it's Monday morning, I'm going to worship at work, I'm going to worship the dollar. We can't do that. It can't be a moment-by-moment moment decision. By definition, of God being God, it is that which you worship, that which is your boss, that which is your Lord, that which is your highest priority, that around which you order, order the entirety of your orbit. Who God is informs your thoughts, informs your motives, informs your words, informs your actions. It informs everything. It is central, and we build the rest of our life around it. It's not moment by moment trying to make a decision of what we should do. It's a decision that is made and an order of priority 
that gets established in every facet of our life. Your God, your Lord, your master, your boss is who or what you serve as the highest priority. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were among the few Jews who, despite everybody worshiping and bowing down to this thing, decided, well, we actually worship a different God than that phony one. So we are not going to bow down to that because that would then make that our God, so we're going to actually have a God. Y'all tracking with me? We good? All right, let's move on. Verse 13, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I've set up? Furious with rage. You ever notice how culture gets angry when one stands on principle while the tide is moving in a different direction. Yet, have you noticed that at all? Have you been on Twitter lately? <laughs> it's amazing how angry the, 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 the initiators of culture, the initiators of new ideas, it's amazing how angry and how quick they are to rage against one who just simply stands on principles. Guys, don't ever let the displeasure of the crowd unanchor you from the truth of God. Don't ever let another's anger, don't ever let another's rage toward you, don't ever let another's displeasure move you off of what is true in God. Don't ever let the wave of culture and the headwind that you're, that you're standing in the rushing river not moving, anchored into something true. Don't ever let the waves of the current unanchor you. Don't do it. One of the greatest tools of the enemy is intimidation. Seduction and intimidation is pretty much all he's got. This looks really nice, so you chase it, or you chase that or I'm throwing you in the furnace. That's pretty much what he does to wreck your life. It's not rocket science. He's not original. He's not creative. I will tantalize with you, or I will boo and scare you into running. That's it. And Nebuchadnezzar rages the text says, with furious rage. And then he goes from furious rage because they're not worshiping what everybody else is worshiping to now threats and actions. It goes on and says, if you're ready to fall down and worship the things I made, very good. Oh, teenagers, all you have to do to be very good with all your friends is just do what they do. It's really that simple. It's not rocket science. Just, just, just dabble in the exact same things that they are, and they'll be good with you. Thank God these teenagers, or at this point they're young men, had some principles. If you bow down to the same thing as everyone else, I'm good. However, he goes on and says, uh, but if you do not worship it, You'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. If you do not do the same things as the rest of us teenagers, you're going to be on the outside looking in. You won't go to the cool kid party. You'll sit at lunch table by yourself. You'll be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? If you do not worship what everyone else is worshiping, you will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. That sounds like a pretty mean threat. Anybody else, like, feeling that? That is a serious threat. It's a mean threat, and it's a scary threat. However, there's only pressure to that threat if you value your life more than you value your relationship with God. Y'all hear what I said? It's only a scary threat if the thing you risk losing is of greater value than the thing you're holding on to. Imagine a robber, burglar comes up to you, robber, whatever, jumps up in your face and goes, give me $100 right now. And if you don't, then I'm going to take a dollar. Give me 100 
But if you don't, I'm going to take one. Okay. How many of you good Christian people would go, God, give me strength? How many of you, hold on, let, let, let me pray about that for just a moment. Oh, Lord, increase my faith. Let you look at that and go, okay, here's your buck. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a no, yeah. come on now, somebody help me out. It's easy. Give me a hundred or else I'm going to take one. Take the one. That doesn't require faith. That doesn't require a monumental move of God. It doesn't require deep prayer and fasting to make that decision. Because one, the one that you're going to take from me, is of significantly less value than the one you're demanding of me. It's silly. And by the way, it's equally as silly to go give up your relationship with God or I'm going to take your life. Actually, it's even sillier because a hundred to one seems like, you know, but it's about a bajillion to one. It's eternity versus now. Bow your knee to the single most important thing in the world. Compromise that and I'll let you keep your life. Or if you don't compromise the most important thing, I will take something of less value, your life. Now, you might be saying, well, Pastor Keith, buddy, how, I don't know what I would do in that situation. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Thank God we're not in that situation right now. But if you were, and you're sitting here now imagining, how would I handle that? And you're wrestling with it. Your priorities are out of whack. If you're wrestling with it, it's because you're seeing bowing before a false god and maintaining this current present life as of semi enough equal value that it's a difficult decision. These guys had amazing moral clarity. They understood that by definition of God being God, everything else isn't. So anything else that orbits around that God, you can take. I'm not giving away that which is most valuable. It's not that challenging. However, if I value my life more, that's what I center my orbit around. Whatever you center your orbit around, whatever is truly of most valuable is really what your God is. And anything else surrounding it can be taken away as long as that central thing does. If you're wrestling with life versus God, you need to try to discern who's at the center. Here's a big idea if you're a note taker. If the consequences of following Jesus determine whether or not you follow Jesus then Jesus isn't your Lord, the consequences are. I'll follow Jesus, but I sure hope it doesn't cost me my popularity at school. And if it's going to cost me my popularity at school, I'll just kind of stop following him for a while. What's your Lord? The consequence of risk of losing your popularity. See, we, we, you and I aren't... aren't by the grace of God, going to face going into a hot furnace. But let's go ahead and establish it now that God is of more value because there are a lot less significant consequences than our life that you and I are yielding to. I probably better keep Jesus compartmentalized at home or at church because at work it might cost me my job, my raise, my promotion. I'm not saying be a jerk at work, but I am saying, what's your Lord? If consequences determine how I follow God, then consequences are the boss, not God. A life lived in Jesus, my friends, is a priority issue. It's not a consequence issue. And these guys had just they, they were just clear 
God is my highest priority. I'm not going to bow down to that, but it's going to cost you your life. Okay. I'm going to put you in a furnace. All right. And here's what I do know. I'm not, I'm not bowing down to that because I only bow to this. this th these knees hit the floor and worship comes out of my mouth for that God, not any other. As their absolute highest priority. Consequences didn't matter to these guys. And quite honestly, it's not rocket science. They shouldn't matter to us. This wasn't a monumental faith move. This is a simple, that's my God, that isn't. It's a priority issue. All right, let's keep going. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, and look how gracious they are. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he'll rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Sounds like such a brave statement. But it's, it's the statement of anyone who truly has a God. Because what we do with the God is we worship it, we trust it, we believe in it, we hold fast to it. And they say, look, our God can deliver us from the fiery furnace. God, God will do his part. By the way, I don't know what his part is. He may have us walk back out of there. We might fry in there. Don't know, don't care. I trust him. That's called having a God. I trust the God that will be with me in that furnace. And because of that, I'm not going to put my trust in you to help me out of this situation. And I'm sure not going to put my trust into that giant statue as somehow that will deliver me. I'm going to do whatever God says to do. I trust him. So often, we trust God as long as God delivers the way we want him to deliver. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Like, all right, I'm going to trust God. I have great faith. God will fulfill this. And then God doesn't fulfill it the way I thought. And now I get rattled. These guys are clear. God's God. If he has a bigger plan, if he has a different plan, if he wants to deliver me, or this is the end, whatever. Like Paul said, hey, man, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Bring it. I will do whatever God wants me to do. And I will trust that God will do whatever God wants to do. See, when I expect God to do what I want, you know who's actually God in that equation? You. Because if he's a God and I worship him as God, I do what he wants. But if I turn around and expect him to do what I want the way I want it, I'm expecting him to follow me as if I'm God. Parents also in this, let, let me help you out. One of the things, these guys have incredible moral clarity on who God is and the difference between them, regardless of the manner in which God chooses to deliver. One of the things sometimes we can do, parents, is we can have our kids be uh, interact with God on a consequence basis. When we do well-intentioned things like this, like, hey, listen, I want you to go talk to your friend. I know it wasn't well. Here's what the Bible says to do. I know we're having some friction. And listen, God will restore the relationship. And then Junior goes over and says, hey, and they initiate a, a, a confrontation. They start talking about an issue. And who knows that sometimes that relationship gets worse. And we told them God would fix it. Here's why you have your kids go reinitiate in a broken relationship. Because it's, it's right. Because scripture says, to the extent that it depends on me, live at peace with one another. So I go and initiate, and I go and I try to restore. Very clear that God can, but may choose not to. I might go, and I was promised by my parents that the Bible says God will restore this, and I might get punched in the nose. That can happen. The flames of the furnace might cook me. That's okay. If he's God, my job is just to obey and do what he says is right. The consequences, we just don't want to raise kids where the consequences help us determine whether God's true or not or God's right or not. 
All right, let's keep going. So here's what happens. They say, God, you know what? Whatever God wants, king, we're not bowing down to that thing. Now, if you're familiar with the intervening, I'm going to just fast forward up towards the end. What happens is the king gets really mad. He tells the guys, turn that oven up seven times hotter than normal. So this thing is like glowing red, super hot, so hot that when they go to throw the guys in, they open the doors, and the guards that open the doors get vaporized on the spot. They burn up and die. And here's what's crazy. It doesn't even say that these three guys were thrown into. We didn't imagine them like, get in there and getting thrown in. The guys that were going to throw them in burned up. So how did they get in there? <laughs> yeah, they just followed God. Okay, we follow authorities. Authorities say I have to be in there for not bowing down to your thing. Okay, they go in. Seven times hotter, kills the guys on the outside, and they stand in the middle of it. Nebuchadnezzar looks through the little window and goes, hey, didn't we put three guys in there? They said, yeah, and he goes, why are there four? And they go, I don't know. Maybe it's an angel. We don't know exactly. Maybe it was Jesus himself because he is the redeemer. We don't know exactly what happened. We just know that they opened the door probably from a distance. They didn't cook and said, come on out of here. The three guys come out. They're not only not burned up. The text says they don't even smell like smoke. <laughs> That's amazing to me. How do you not, you're in a fire, how do you not smell like smoke? You ever been in a car with somebody who smoked like one cigarette like nine years ago and your clothes smell forever? Right, and then you put them in your closet and your whole closet reeks and you're like, oh my gosh, what's burning? Somebody lit a cigarette nine years ago. It's like, oh. these guys are in the fire. They don't even smell like smoke. And they come out and now Nebuchadnezzar goes, verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar says, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I decree, and he goes off the rails a little bit here, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and that their houses be turned into piles of rubble. Just... Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Do, do you understand? A pagan king, out of his own mouth, says, man, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Praise to the God, look at this, who sent his angel and rescued him, they trusted in him and defied the king's commands. Could you imagine the biggest bully in your school coming, the, you know, the one that like gives you a wedgie, the one that gives you a swirly, the one with the wet willies, the one that razzes you about your Christian faith, oh, Bible thumping, one that just gives you the worst time. Could you imagine out of that bully's mouth Going, praise to the God of Hannah. Because you know what? She stood. Praise to the God. She defied what all of us knuckleheads were doing, and she stood her ground. That's a God. Could you imagine the biggest bully at Foundation Academy going, man, praise to the God of Parker. I've never seen anything like it. Dude, we tried to knock him off course. We tried to derail him, and he just defied and defied and defied. That dude wouldn't bend his knee. Man, praise to that God. It says, praise to the God of Brooke. Because her, think about this. Now, this is the bully. Because she was willing even to lay down her life. She was willing even at the extent of her popularity. She was willing even at the extent of a prom date. She was willing even at the extent of that boy who couldn't keep his hands to himself to even not even have a boyfriend. Man, praise to a God that will anchor a young woman's heart like that. See, it sounds like such a big statement. Praise to the God. And it, it, it says, they trusted in him, defied the king's command. And look at this. 
were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God. That seems like a huge statement. They would give up their lives rather than deny God. It's only a big statement if you like your life more than you like God. Here's your last little big idea for your note takers. The threat of fire simply reveals what our true God is. What you lose by virtue of staying in worship only to God, the heat of the fire, that reveals what your true God is. When you will say no and bow your knee to something else, all that does is show you what your true God is. Is it your life? That's a pale God, as much as I want to keep mine. Don't get me wrong. I want my life. And I want a job. And I want friends. And in Christ, I can actually have all of those. But if Christ cost me any of those, so be it. It's okay to want your life and Jesus. It's just not okay to want your life above Jesus. It's okay to want popularity. It's okay to not want to be teased. It's okay to desire to have a good reputation. It's okay to like your family. It's okay to want to be married. It's okay to want all of those. It's just not okay to put them in a place above God. All right, can you help me out with some music? Let's land this bird. For these three guys, it's this simple, guys. It's not rocket science. God was actually their God. (laughs) Not just in name. Apparently, there were a lot of Jews in the land that took the name of Jews, followers of God, that weren't. These guys, these giants of the faith that have this monumental moment in God where they'll step into the fire. You know what they were? They were just actual real followers of God. It's just, it's just, that's it. They didn't need a big moment. They didn't need to muster some incredible courage. They just said, well, I'm not bowing to that, ever. Well, it's going to cost you your life. Big deal. I'm not bowing to that, ever. They trusted God alone. He alone was the bottom line thing of more value of everything, including their own life really what they had was moral clarity. It's not rocket science. They were clear on what the real treasure is. And if you find yourself wrestling, it's my prayer that you would really have clarity on what the real treasure is. We don't need more faith. We don't need more courage. We don't need more boldness. We need clarity. It's a hundred to one, only a million to one. It's not rocket science. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you to be in a position to see you do amazing things is as simple as just being with you in whatever position you put us. Give us great clarity. Father, if any of us in here wrestle with being defined by circumstances, wrestle with the weight of consequences, God, aren't sure of the true value of a relationship with you, I'm asking you, sir, for all of us here, those watching online on our live stream, God, right now, would you call to mind everything that we stand up in competition to you? God, if there is anything in our minds, God, if there's anything in our hearts, there's anything in our devotion, God, that would truly be a God. If there's something else other than Jesus around which we are building the orbit of our life, would you show us what it is that we could just simply topple it and toss that thing in the furnace? Jesus, may every one of us have great clarity in a confused age, in a dark age, in a Babylonian modern day age. God, would we have great clarity of who God is, the treasure we have in Christ. And would it be a priority issue of just simply placing you first of higher value than anything? 
not rocket science, God. Just really understand a little bit about who you are. We love you and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, have an awesome Sunday. Sign your kids up for VBS. There is a mission team meeting. If you're going to Cuba, you know that already, but I'm reminding you so you don't leave. We're heading back to Elevate. Be blessed. Have an awesome Sunday. Peace.